Good evening. Okay, ladies and gents, uh, thanks a million for making your way down to the Pest Building tonight. We're very delighted to have you. I'm John Perry. I'm the new uh, head of department for physical education and sports science. I, it, this is how I intend to dress every day now, just to, to recognise the importance of my position. Thanks. Um, I've, I've obviously a lot of work to do, having inherited... Uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, I'm, uh, the, the thing that makes me very fortunate is the fact that I'm, I'm able to take on a department that's in such a fantastic shape um, because it's been led so well for the last half dozen years by uh, the man we're here to listen to this evening. So it's wonderful to uh, get such a lovely turnout. Uh, that's pretty much my job now done, which is great, apart from answering a few, um, or taking on the Q&A at the end. Uh, so my next port of call is to introduce you to the president of University of Limerick, uh, Professor Kirsten May. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Distinguished guests, esteemed faculty members, colleagues, students, friends, uh, and I would like to extend a particularly warm welcome to the family uh, of Professor Giles Vorken, to Amy, Sharon, uh, Shona, sorry, I, I knew I would get it wrong, <laughs> Shona, and to, uh, to partner uh, Anne. Uh, it's great that you all could make it here uh, to the um, inaugural lecture of Professor Giles Vorken. And it is a great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Giles to you all, a remarkable leader in the field of human performance and innovation. And this week marks the culmination of a six-year term as the head of the Department of Physical Education and Sports Science, which he now has handed over to uh, John uh, Perry. Um, uh, it's a role in which Giles has demonstrated exceptional leadership and dedication to the advancement of our academic community, which is evident in uh, sports science being amongst the 100 leading um, uh, uh, providers uh, in the uh, QS rankings and amongst the 40 uh, leaders, uh, 40 leading universities or disciplines in the university in the Shanghai rankings. And that is a remarkable achievement, a team effort, but the team effort also requires leadership. And we have seen that leadership in application here. Giles' journey is nothing short of extraordinary in his field of study. A professor of human performance and innovation, co-director of the Sport and Human Performance Research Center, and a founding member of the Jockey Health, Wellbeing and Performance Research Group, Giles has played a pivotal role in shaping the landscape of sports science and performance psychology at both UL and indeed contributing to it on a wider international stage. Before joining University of Limerick, Professor Warrington served as a senior lecturer in the School of Health and Human Performance at uh, DCU. And prior to his academic roles, he spent 12 years at the National Coaching and Training Center based right here at UL. During his tenure, he developed and oversaw the implementation of the International Carding Scheme, providing invaluable support services to elite and developmental Irish athletes. Giles' impact extends far beyond our campus, reaching the global stage. As a practitioner, he served as a head performance psychologist, or physiologist, physiologist and sports science. There are too many psychologists in past, I remarked earlier. So I start again. As a practitioner, he served as a head performance physiologist and sports science lead to the Olympic Council of Ireland for 14 years, contributing to the success of Irish athletes at six Olympic Games. In his inaugural lecture titled Practitioner to Pracademic Sport and Human Performance Pathways and Evolving Research Agendas, Professor Warren will share insights from his illustrious career. From his experience at the British Olympic Medal Center to his work with the highly successful GB rowing team, Giles will take us on a journey through over 30 years of dedication to high performance sport. More importantly, he will delve into the transition from practitioner to pracademic exploring how his wealth of applied experiences has influenced his teaching approaches and shaped his research agenda. 
His lecture promises to be an enlightening exploration of the power of mentoring, coaching, and the development of applied practitioner skills in our graduates. And I do feel that we as a university can also learn a lot from his skills in terms of for, uh, forming high performance individuals and high performance teams in order to thrive as an institution. I invite each of you to join us for this insightful and engaging lecture as we celebrate the wealth of knowledge and experience that Professor Giles Warrington brings to our academic community. Together, let us applaud his achievements and look forward to the inspiration and wisdom that Giles will undoubtedly share with us this evening. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kirsten. <laughs> Thanks, Kirsten. Uh, no pressure, so. Um, I actually finished up as head of department on Monday, and I'm told I'm 10 years younger already. And that hair, hair is starting to grow back a little bit. And you, I had hair like you when I started. OK. So listen, it's uh, really humbling to be standing here in front of colleagues. Um, thank you, President, the Dean here, the Provost as well. Um, friends, a lot of friends from a long period of time. Some I haven't seen in a long time, but very importantly, family. So I'm delighted uh, my two daughters are here, Amy and Shona. They've just uh, flown in from America with their mum, Michelle, uh, yesterday. And so they're probably a bit jet lagged. And being a dad as I am, I'm probably going to embarrass them and send them to sleep. So uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll try not to do that. Also delighted uh, my partner, Anne, is here as well. Um, unfortunately, her three children, Jen, um, Frank and Niall, couldn't be here because they're coming back from America as well. So there's obviously something about America at the moment. I don't know what it is. So anyway, um, when, I, when I was preparing the lecture, I was thinking what might be an interesting title, bearing in mind there's going to be academics, friends, colleagues, athletes, etc. here. So I came up with one bit of a strange one. A practitioner, which is what I was when I started. I very much see myself as a pracademic, a practical academic in terms of my approaches. So I'm going to really just talk a little bit about my pathway, my journey to this point now. But certainly... I see my history in front of me here with the, everybody that's here, so it's lovely to see everybody, and thank you for coming tonight. Um, my association with the University of Limerick and this fantastic campus that we have goes back over 30 years, and I'm based in the, the Pest Building where we are now, and in 31 years, which is a bit disappointing, my journey has been 10 feet. <laughs> so I've moved from my very first office when I was in the NCTC 10 feet to my current office, and that's it. Now, th there was a bit of meandering in between and around that, so uh, that's what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my meandering journey and where it all began. Believe it or not, banking, okay? <laughs> banking is where I started. <laughs> Don't ask me why. Now, my, B with a B, with a B, with a B. <laughs> Thank you. Was that, was that Sharon? It, I knew it would be Sharon now. <laughs> okay. My, my, father, my father was involved in international finance, and it just seemed a logical route to go. So uh, when I left school with A-levels, I had no aspirations to go to university, and I got on an accelerated management training program. And within a week, I realized I'd made a horrendous mistake. I absolutely hated it with a passion. I survived three years, but it gave me a wake-up call. And the question I had to ask myself is, what are you passionate about? And the one thing I kept coming back to was sport. That was what I was passionate about. And I thought, well, how do I create a career in sport, the thing I love, the thing that I've always been associated with? And doing a bit of searching, I came across this term sport science. And I thought, what the hell is that? So the more research I did, I thought, OK, this is going to be interesting. This is something I'm going to pursue. Bearing in mind, I didn't do any uh, A-levels or O-level science qualifications. So a non-scientist going into sport science. So uh, eventually, I, I went to uh, St. Mary's at Strawberry Hill, which is a very strong Irish association. Had a fantastic time there. Going there and learning science for the medium of sport just blew my imagination. So that, that was a, a big turning point for me. I got to the end of my degree, a three-year degree. I hadn't got a clue what I was going to do. My next-door neighbor, um, when we were at college, he knocked on the door one day and he said, did you see the advert for a job at the British Olympic Medical Center? I said, no. The deadline was the following day. So I thought, I'll, I'll throw an ap application in. And uh, lo and behold, I was successful. So I got a job at the British Olympic Medical Center working as a sport and exercise physiologist um, with the elites in, 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 in sport. And 
It was interesting that uh, one of my key mentors, who I'll talk about in a moment, Professor Craig Sharp, who was the director of the center, when he appointed me afterwards, I asked him, why was I appointed? What was the reason that I was successful? And he said, you had a sports science degree, as everybody else did. It was your extracurricular activity and engagement. It was the coaching qualifications, all the additional things that you did. That's what made you stand out. So that's what I say to a lot of students. When you arrive, make sure you get involved in as many opportunities as you possibly can in terms of that process. So I went to the British Olympic Medical Center. I planned to stay for a year, and I was going to go to Loughborough to do my master's. But whilst I was there, uh, Craig approached me and he said, what about doing a PhD with the British rowing team? And the British rowing team at that time were very, very successful. I thought, God, this sounds interesting. So that's where the journey started. So I stayed on. So my very first world championships was the World Rowing Championships in Vienna, providing support. I then developed a program of, of study, uh, working with the GB rowing team, pr principally focused on altitude training, the effects of altitude training on sea level performance. So you can see in the picture there, a full head of hair, John, okay? Um, so working, working at high altitude in the Austrian Alps, a place called Silveretta, middle of nowhere, and very boring, but it was a good training environment, working with the rowers and monitoring them as part of their training and looking at the adaptations effects on performance. Front of the boat there, um, just to show you the caliber of the, the athletes, James Cracknell, double Olympic gold medalist. Okay, so, so it was a great opportunity to do that. So I stayed there uh, and I was there for three years and then an opportunity came up in Ireland, which seemed really appealing. And at the National Coaching and Training Center as head of player athlete services. So I was still doing my PhD, but I thought, you know what, this, this looks like a really interesting opportunity. So I, I came to the NCTC in 1993, thinking I might stay for a while, and I haven't looked back since. So that was the, the starting point from there. Um, as part of that, um, I was asked to get involved by Noel Murphy, who was the, the, the chair of the NCTC at the time, who was the manager of the Irish rugby team going to the World Cup in 95. Would I become the fitness advisor to the team? And uh, Woody is smiling at me there. I, my association with, Wood, with Keith Wood goes back a long, a long time. Woody would have been part of that journey. And it was interesting. That was at the cusp of, from amateur to professional. So there was me working full-time in the NCTC as a fitness advisor. We hadn't heard of strength conditioning coaches at the time. And I was doing that part-time. The athletes, the players were all over the country, and some of them based in London. I don't think, were you at Quinn's then? No, I'm still here. You're still here. You were still here. So that's where we were. It was very different. We did our high-altitude preparation training in Kilkenny. <laughs> that, 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 that gives you the idea of where we were. And uh, so it, it, it was certainly an interesting experience. And um, certainly it, it was a very memorable trip. It was an incredible trip. And it was just on the cusp. So now if you look at the provincial teams now, they have a plethora of support staff, strength conditioning coaches, etc. I was doing it as a part-time venture at that time. Now, of course, Woody, as we know, went back to South Africa two years later as part of the Lions and had that uh, iconic victory over the, the Lions um, in South Africa. So that was a, a, an interesting experience. Then, through my work with um, some of our top athletes, I went to my first Olympic Games in Atlanta, 96, so that's a long time ago now. Um, that was the, the first one I, uh, I attended. Then going on to Sydney. So Sydney obviously had unique challenges in terms of travel, jet lag, travel fatigue, sleep, and that's where my interest in sleep and sleep science was developed. So spending a lot of time out there uh, at training camps and also supporting the athletes at the Games. Then moving on to Athens um, was, was the next game. At this point, I became uh, an official part of the science and medical team with the Olympic Council. So that was my first game where I, I wasn't working independently. I was part of, the, of that process. And I'll talk a little bit about those as we go along. I then moved to DCU. Uh, an opportunity came up to move into academia um, in 2005. Um, and I was there for 10 years. Um, at that time, now something I could talk about is that we started to develop the jockey research. So that came, came in around that time, as I was leaving NCTC and moving into DCU. Um, then Beijing came along, and Rod, where are you? I can't see you. Rod, Rod McLaughlin, uh, an old colleague of mine, who was the medical officer for the Olympic Council. Um, we would have worked together in terms of the preparation in, Be in Beijing. Um, and then London came along. So London, the, 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 the local games, and Sharon was involved in that. Um, who else is there? Um, Sarah Jane was involved with me. So I had a different role in London. Not only was I the sports science support uh, person, but I was also the team manager for the pre-games training camp. And Sarah Jane worked alongside me 
uh, there, and Kira was involved as well. So uh, that was a different role. So it was interesting, and I really enjoyed it, and it was a great opportunity, a great experience. I then moved home, came back to Limerick, to, which is my home, where I've always lived, um, in 2015. Um, and I would have gone to my last games in Rio. Again, I was running the training camp. Sarah Jane was again alongside me. And that was my last Olympics, and that was the decision I took um, because it is, it is very time-consuming. It's a young person's game as well. So it was time to, to step off and, and move on. Then I moved into the head of department role, which I've done for the last six years, which has just been an amazing experience in an amazing department. And I suppose the final piece for me so far in the journey was the establishment of the Sport and, uh, uh, Sport, Sport and Human Performance Research Centre. So that just gives you a little pot of history. And I'm just going to pick a few of the highlights that I'm just going to cover over the next period of time. I wanted to talk a little bit about the power of mentoring. I've been really, really fortunate in my career. Three, three mentors, okay, one of them in the room here, Professor Morgan, where are you? Okay, he's here. My first mentor, I mentioned him already, Professor Craig Sharp. So he um, was a real pioneer in terms of exercise physiology, sport and exercise physiology. Um, he was the first appointed sports science lecturer in the UK, in Birmingham in 1970. He was then the director of the Olympic Medical Centre, and by strange coincidence, he was the inaugural professor of sport and exercise science in UL. And just by chance, I happened to come here. It was a coincidence. So I wasn't working in the same department, but obviously he's been a huge mentor to me. Sadly, he's, uh, he's uh, departed. Um, he was my PhD supervisor as well, and he became a very close and dear friend to me as well. Um, the next person, Professor Pat Duffy, Pat, as I'm sure many of you know, um, he was a graduate of uh, physical education here, a real visionary both in Ireland, UK, and international sport. He was the director of the National Coaching and Training Centre and certainly had major influence on my thinking and approaches to, to what we did. Always challenging you, always challenging you to think differently. And certainly his legacy is enormous, and sadly Pat is no longer with us. But in honour of his achievements, our department, on a biannual basis, have a, 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 an annual uh, a distinguished lecture series, and Keith has actually uh, delivered one of those for us. So that, again, that's a true legacy. And then there's Prof Morgan, as I call him, the three profs, and nicknamed him Prof because he's the fountain of knowledge. Okay, and he's become a, a great friend of mine. You know, we probably speak to each other twice a week on the phone. Um, so not only was he a mentor, he became an incredible friend to me. And and if I was to get a euro every time I've probably uh, repeated a mantra or a message he said, I'll be a multi-multi-millionaire at this stage. No question about that. He's probably sick of hearing that. So I've got my embarrassing bit in for you there, okay? <laughs> as I said, I would. So one thing that's always fascinated me is human endeavor and human performance and achievement. So if you take this example here, this iconic photograph um, of Roger Bannister breaking the four-minute mile, this humble um, medical student um, you can see the date there, 6th of May 1954, Ifley in um, Oxford, Oxford University. At that time, they said, the experts said it was impossible to run a four-minute mile. Impossible. So I would put that up there with the other great achievements, human achievements of the 20th century, climbing Everest, man on the moon. It would be up there. What was interesting about that, so he broke the four-minute mile when they said it couldn't be done. 46 days later... John Landy, his great rival, broke the four-minute mile. And that stood for three years. If I'm correct, 357.9. Okay? So what I would say is human performance and achievement, we create the barriers. It's our imagination that creates the barriers. So this glass ceiling was shattered, and then it moved on. Okay? And what we see now, interestingly, an Irishman, Eamon Coughlin, nearly 43, the first man over 40 to break the four-minute mile. So suddenly we've gone from it being impossible to within 46 days somebody else doing it and now athletes in their later career achieving that. Now very interestingly, Eamon Coughlin's son John has also broken a four minute mile and there's only eight sons and fathers who have done that achievement in the world. So it's, it's, in, it's interesting, it's fascinating. So that's what's driven me, that's the question that's always driven me throughout my career around human performance. What determines performance? Well, first of all, we have genetics, okay? In this slide here, you can see two individuals. In the white coat here is Per Olof Ostrand, who is the godfather of exercise physiology. He wrote the textbook of works physiology. And his student there is Benk Solting, who was one of the most famous muscle physiologists 
and an altitude physiologist as well. Ostrand once said, if you want to be an Olympic champion, you choose your parents carefully. <laughs> okay? Do we, do we agree with that? So what in the words, unless you get the right parents, you might as well forget about it. I don't think we fully subscribe to that. Genetics is going to be very important if you're a 100 meter sprinter or if you're a marathon runner, okay? But there's a lot of athletes in the middle who probably don't come from the right gene pool who have gone on to be Olympic champions. So we just need to think about that. But genetics is important. If you take Michael Phelps, for example, the, 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 the iconic swimmer, 28 Olympic medals, 23 gold medals, one Olympic Games, he won eight gold medals in Beijing. So if he was a country, he'd be in the top 10 of the medal table. Okay, think about that. If you look at him, if you look at his physiology, if you look at his makeup, six foot five, uh, uh, 197, 197 wingspan, so he's like an albatross, okay? He's got a long torso, relatively short legs, size 14 feet, so he's got flippers, and he's double jointed elbows, wrists, and ankles. So he's probably as close to a fish as you probably get, okay? <laughs> so bear that in mind. But does he train, or did he train? You're damn right he trained up to six hours a day when he was um, preparing for competition, and he was consuming somewhere around 10,000 kilocalories. So you think the average, if you look on the cereal box, they say for a male it's around 2,500. So that's a lot of food to take in. So yes, genetics is important, but we know training is important as well. So the environment is going to be important as well. Stephen Redgrave, in my view, the greatest Olympian there ever was. He was uh, Olympic champion for 20 years, five gold medals in rowing. And I was very fortunate to work with him in my early career. So it's not only about genetics, it's how you express those genes through training, the technical, tactical, mental, physical. Just an indication of the training that he did. So when he won his last gold medal in Sydney, they calculated for every stroke he rode in the final, which is approximately 220 strokes, he trained 34 hours per stroke. So imagine the volume of training you're doing there. So it's just interesting to think about that. And then we have all the other pieces, and I've highlighted sleep because that's my big bugbear, because sleep for me is the most potent recovery tool we have, and we don't use it effectively. But there's all these other factors that come into play. Okay, so just to bear in mind those as well. Um, again, this is similar to the last slide, but what I want to emphasize is the importance that theologies, physiology, psychology, biomechanics, nutrition, strength conditioning, the roles that they play in terms of influencing the athlete through the training, um, through, through the genetics, and ultimately you're trying to achieve sport performance, okay? And just a couple of very iconic Irish athletes, Ian Wiley, Sonia O'Sullivan. I remember the first day I arrived in the NCTC, Ian Wiley was knocking on my door wanting to start work. So first day in, okay, I'd work with the slalom team in the UK, so Ian was very keen to start doing that. We have a very long and positive relationship over that time. So I talked about the games. All the games had different challenges. So one of my roles is working with the athletes in preparation, but also developing the preparation strategies for the athletes. So if you look at some of the examples there, Beijing, it was travel, it was heat, it was pollution. That was a big problem. Um, Sydney was obviously going to be the heat. It was going to be the travel, most definitely, was going to be a challenge there. In Athens, it was the extreme heat and the strength of the sun was a challenge. So we need to bear in mind that. And Rio was a real mix of things both in terms of the culture as well, the size of the place, security, the language, and all the other variabilities in the mix. So we, 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 we need to think about those. Um, so what we did is we developed uh, preparation strategies. So going back to um, Athens, what we did is we developed simple posters. We identified what were the key variables. We pinned these posters on all the walls in the village, and we gave them little cards, cue cards. It was effective to a point, highlighting the key areas, but we knew we could improve on it. So moving on to Beijing, and Rod is here. Rod would have developed the medical booklet. So we developed short, punchy, evidence-based booklets around preparation. So I would have worked with colleagues um, in the NCTC uh, looking at the whole preparation and acclimatization as being part of that process. And then moving on again, when we got to Rio, we realized the athletes were very tech-savvy, tech so we developed an app, a simple app that went on the phone gave them key information that they could just tap into, how to prepare effectively, what was the details, information about Zika virus, all this kind of thing. So we moved from posters, booklets, to something that was a bit more meaningful, constantly changing and evolving in terms of what we did. Now, a question I'm often asked is, which was my favorite Olympic Games? Now, what I'd say is, they all had their special elements. They're all iconic, but I would have to say London. And for one simple reason, 
I've got to share it with my girls. <laughs> so normally when you're at the games, you don't really get to see much because you're working all the time. So knowing that they were coming over, knowing it was nearby, sorry girls, I know I had to embarrass you. <laughs> no, knowing that they were going to be around, we had the opportunity to go and see some of the events. So they got to see one of Katie Taylor's medal fights as well. And they got to meet Katie Taylor afterwards as well. So, you know, it was great for me because sometimes there's a lot of sacrifice Missing weddings, and I've missed two of my best friend's weddings from, from Olympics, but the fact that they could be there was very important to me. So moving along a little bit then to um, my time in NCTC, and some of my colleagues are here, Sheila, Declan, Liam, who am I going to miss now? I'm sure I'm going to miss somebody. Oh, uh, Cora. Cora, Cora, sorry, Cora. Um, so that was a special time in Irish sport as well. So NTTC, which became Coaching Ireland, and obviously the key areas that we worked in, the, the National Coaching Development Programme, which Declan would have worked with closely with Liam. Much of my work was not only supporting athletes, um, but also developing the international carding scheme, the system where they were financially supported and the support services that, were, that, that they got. And we have a few athletes here, John, Valerie, and I'm probably going to miss a couple of others as well, so apologies. So that was a key piece of what I did, okay? And there's a, there's a legacy piece to that. But the other piece that we worked on as well is pathways, building pathways in Irish sport. So looking at long-term player-athlete development, okay? So there was a lot of work there. And we published um, a, a document which was the first of its kind to be published in the world, looking at long-term player-athlete development and, and pathways. What I'd say about the carding scheme, 25 years on, it's still in place. So obviously, there must be some positive legacy from that. It's now administered by Sport Ireland, but the, the, the principles of the carding scheme that we had going way back to the NCTC days still remain to this day. So again, that, that was an important point within that. So the long-term player athlete development model. So this is what it looked like in principle. So it's looking at the stage of development of young athletes from the fundamental up to the train to win if they choose to go down that direction. And it identifies from a technical, tactical, mental, physical lifestyle, what are the key components we need to develop as we progress through the pathway, okay? Now, that's quite an elitist model. So just a word of caution in and around that. So I think the important thing to remember, and this is the model, and Sheila would have been closely involved in this as well, LISPA, Lifelong Involvement in Physical Activity and Sport. So the point is that very few people are going to go down this pathway. How many of our young children are going to get to that train to win competing for Ireland? The vast majority are going to get into active living, active recreation, organised sport and social sport. But the fundamental thing is they should go for these fundamentals, the learn to play and practice, the physical literacy. So we're not saying it's an elite model, everybody goes there. What we're saying is that everybody should have the right to go to the fundamentals, the learn to play and practice, and then choose their pathway. And they may change over time. So that, that model, going back to 2005, is the basis a lot of policy has been developed on. So there's certainly clear legacy developed in and around that. And um, just an example of the pathway. So a lot of sports have adopted it now. Here's the GAA one. So again, taking those fundamental mo uh, movement skills right up to training to win and looking at those elements. Now, the vast majority of my career is very much focused in this area here. But in later life, I've moved down to these areas here, principally because I was a dad. So my two girls were playing hockey. So for five years, I was coaching the Limerick girls under 12, 13, 14 team, but also Gwell Colossal Limney. I was coaching the girls' teams there. And so I'd moved down there. And then since I met Anne, I've, I've moved into GAA. I've become the GAA head now, <laughs> OK? So with Ath and Rye. And um, there's uh, Anne with her, her children. There's Jen. Jen is actually doing PE here now. So she's first year PE, a PE and maths. So she's now playing uh, senior camogie with Ath and Rye and also playing for the college as well. Frank, uh, her brother there, um, that's the, is that the 15s or 16s cup? The 16s. So this, this is from this year. So they won the, the county under-16s. That's their four in a row. So they've done 16, 15, 14, 13. So that was a big achievement. And Frank has just got into the, the minor panel for uh, Galway as well. And then Frank, uh, sorry, Niall would have um, won the, 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 the A county final last year as well. Big achievement for the club as well. Last year, they won Fela, the Fela All-Ireland for the first time. So that was a huge achievement for the club, and you know, I, I'm actively involved at the underage level. It's infectious. I never realised what I was missing. It's incredible. Okay, so just moving on. So I'm, I'm shifting across a little bit now, just talking about some of the research activity I've been involved with. And the jockey research, which has been really interesting, developed from a chance discussion. 
a phone call from Adrian McGoldrick, who was at the time the chief medical officer of the Turf Club, the Irish Horse Racing Regulatory Board, as it's called now. Adrian was due to be here tonight, but unfortunately he's sick. Um, he rang me about a, a prominent jockey, Johnny Murta, and I'm not divulging any secrecies here because Johnny has talked about this on the media, so there's no, no issues there. He was coming to the middle, later part of his career, and he was in a constant problem with making weight. And this was a big issue. So Adrian wanted me to meet him, to have a conversation. Johnny came down, and I think he thought he was just going to the lab, run a few tests, Bob's your uncle, here we go. It didn't happen like that. So he came in, I wanted to get under the bonnet. So we had a conversation about, talk to him about what you do on a daily basis. So from getting up early to do his riding out, getting to the race course, avoiding any fluid or nutrition and intake, almost starving himself throughout the day. And I suppose I was used to working weight category athletes, lightweight rowers and boxers. This was completely different to what I'd experienced. So I tried to keep my jaw off the floor. And I think at the end of the day, I asked him a question. So, so when do you hydrate? And he said, um, I think October normally. <laughs> so, so, so that was quite interesting from that point of view. But you know, certainly he's had a very successful career. But what's fantastic, Johnny is retired now. He's now a successful trainer. He's a great advocate for the work we're doing, working with the young jockeys that are coming through his, his stables. So that's been a, a, a great example of that. So it was an opportunity. And what, what, sorry, what happened at that time as well, there was a couple of fatalities in horse racing. So the Turf Club set up a health and safety committee to look at this. And one of the recommendations, we need to do some research. So we were commissioned to start that research process. And we, we did an initial study, one of the first that's done. And Michael Griffin, who's here, was part of that, uh, that study there. And it was really looking at the, the impact of chronic, chronic rate control on physiological function and bone health in jockeys, looking at the elite jockeys. And some of the data was quite startling in terms of the uh, poor bone health, high incidence of osteopenia, that's, whoops, the step down before osteoporosis, severe levels of dehydration. But also what we saw is that the vast majority of the, the athletes in the study were injured. And if you think about horse racing, it's the only sport in the world where you're followed by two ambulances as you're going around the course. That's the level that you're, you're dealing with in that. And one of our recommendations is future research is required. And that was the launch pad to what we've done and moved on to within the jockey research. Um, just to give you an indication of the achievements since that starting point now. So our total research funding for the, for the jockey research is just over 1.4 million. Um, we've had 30 peer-reviewed journal publications, over 30 conference presentations. So far, through our program, three PhDs, one master's completed, two postdocs, and um, currently we have six PhD students. But I think more importantly, rather than just the, the, the metric, the impact, the minimum riding weights uh, in Ireland hadn't changed for a century. But we knew that people were getting taller, were getting heavier. So we were just squeezing bigger jockeys into tighter restrictions. So based on the research we've done, the minimum weights have increased on two occasions. We've also established a jockey pathway. And alongside that, we've now implemented an evidence-based sports science medical support education program for the jockeys to help them make weight e easier. So yes, we can increase the weights, but we need to help them with that. So not only are there a metric output, but there's clear impact from there. Now, just to embarrass a few more people there. So that's our team, OK? So I mentioned Adrian. Jennifer Pugh, Dr. Jennifer Pugh is here. She's the, the current uh, medical officer, chief medical officer. Um, Sarah Jane, now Sarah Jane and I go back a long way, okay? So she did her undergrad with me in DCU. She then did a PhD with me, a postdoc, and then she worked with me um, with two Olympic Games. I joke with uh, Amy and Shona that she's my third daughter. So that's, that's how far we go back. Um, Gillian uh, is uh, the, the, the nutritionist, a clinical dietitian, uh, sports nutritionist, so she's working extensively within that. Kira Losty, psychologist, uh, working in Setu. Um, uh, Siobhan O'Connor, um, who's looking at the injury epidemiology based out of DCU. And then we've had a series of PhDs that graduated. Ema Dolan was the first. Um, I'll talk about her in a moment. Mikey Kiley, who's here. Mikey's gone on to be the, the head of uh, athletic development with Connacht Rugby. Um, uh, Lewis King is now lecturing in TUS and Athlone, and uh, Dr. Arthur Dunn um, did his uh, postdoc with us and has just uh, secured a job in Setu in Waterford as well, and Arthur's here as well. And then just finally, these are our current cohort of uh, PhD students. The one thing I'd say, they're really nice people to work with. It's a fun group to have. You know, everybody's working together, pulling together, and we have a bit of fun as well. So just to, to, to bear that in mind. Going back to Craig. 
my mentor. So Ema was my first PhD student. Craig had examined over 120 PhD students. Ema was my first, it was Craig's last PhD examination. So that was kind of a nice fitting uh, end to that process. So moving on then, more recently. So we've uh, launched the Sport and Human Performance Research Center, which is a priority research center in the university. Um, and you can see the themes as part of that. Center was launched by uh, Lord Sebastian Coe in 2021. And you can see the, the areas that we focused on. And it's growing and becoming stronger and stronger as we progress with that. And just to give you some indications of the work, so the center was officially launched in 2021 as a priority center, but the work has been going on since 2017. So we have over 70 members in the research center, uh, over 650 publications, and much of that is international research. So with that internationalization element, and we've had 21 PhDs graduate, and just in excess of uh, 8 million in terms of the funding that we've uh, received in relation to that. So just very briefly then, before I start to wrap up, I think it's important we just don't focus on the research, but the challenges that I see as educators. So I'm coming as a pracademic, so I, I see what industry needs as part of that process. When you think of sports science, there's all the ologies, there's all these different elements. So maybe when I was studying, there was four or five. It's much broader now, so there's a whole mix of those. So constantly thinking about what, are, what do we need from our graduates? What are the attributes? What are the skills they need? Are they industry ready? Are they there to, if it's sports science, it could be exercise science, I'm picking on sports science. Um, do they have those applied skills? So they may have the, the knowledge, but can they apply it in a challenging setting? So to think about those. Think of it as a, a sports scientist acting as the conductor of the orchestra. There could be a, a multidisciplinary team, and you may be a senior person within that, trying to make sure everybody's pulling together to work effectively. In, in performance sport, it's certainly high stakes. You know, you've got to be delivering, okay? There's a credibility window as well there. And you have to have those soft skills to work as part of a team as being a key part of that. And very much, you've got to be an innovator. Innovation is so important. You've got to be a problem solver. You've got to be able to innovate on the job. Okay? Sometimes there's no opportunity to sit back. You've got to react to that. And again, I think the important thing is bridging the gap between research and practice. Sometimes the research is, is behind. So there's, there's evidence-based practice, but there's practice-based evidence as well. So just to think about those elements as well. Um, when we talk about high-performance teams, traditionally in sports science, they've been multidisciplinary, quite siloed and separate. So that all the different ologies and disciplines, they're working, but they're not linking together and working together. So we talk about multidisciplinary. What we're seeing more and more now, we're moving in, into the interdisciplinary. So we're learning new ideas, some innovation being involved. So that's the model we're trying to move to more fully integrated in what we do. And ideally, in a perfect world, we go to that transdisciplinary. We're really problem solving at a very, very high level, working incredibly close together. So we certainly moved away from multidisciplinary. We're into interdisciplinary. And hopefully, more and more of the work will be transdisciplinary as part of that. And that's what we do in our program. So this is just an example on the Masters in Applied Sport Performance. We have all the areas. And what we try and do is problem solve in an interdisciplinary fashion. So we give them tasks set over a week where they really need to focus and develop in terms of what they're doing. So having an interdisciplinary approach to solving a problem that we'll create for them, which is what's going to happen in real life. And that's just one of the testimonies from one of the students. The continued interdisciplinary discussion going on in the department is refreshing and meaningful. So that just really underlines the, the importance of that, that process. Kirsten's raised it already. I've got to do the, the little boast at the end, okay? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm certainly very proud of the department. It's been fantastic leading it. We have incredible staff, very driven staff, very passionate staff who work together. We have great programs. We have fantastic research going on. But we have brilliant students as well, both undergraduate and postgraduate. And that's reflected in terms of our ranking. So in the Shanghai, we've moved up to 40 um, in 2022. And then the QS... We're in the, we've stayed consistently in the top 100, okay? And uh, we are the highest ranked department in the university. We have aspirations to move higher, but to do that will require investment and real clear thought process in terms of strategically what we want to achieve. So that's just to, to bear, bear that in mind. So finishing up then, I'm just watching my time now. I think I'm okay. Um, some of the key take-homes that I've experienced from my career, what I think is important. That's kind of the model I like to work with with athletes. You've got to work hard, okay? But very importantly, you've got to recover well. Okay, and that's going to be your best performance. And sometimes more is less and less is more. Okay, so bear that in mind. Learning is messy. I got that off Liam. Okay, 
It is messy. Learning is messy. It has to be in terms of part of that process. It isn't just about ability. I, I've been incredibly lucky in my career. I've had some lucky breaks. But as Sanaka said, um, uh, luck is when uh, uh, preparation meets opportunity. So if you're prepared, you're going to grasp those opportunities. So there is luck involved within that. And from my own bitter experience, I say to people, follow your passions, whatever you do. Follow your passions. You know, don't get bogged up in a career that's really boring and uninteresting. I had a second chance, and I really grasped it. Can't say more than the power of mentoring. Shane has set up a fantastic mentoring program in the university, and I was delighted when he asked me to be the, the EHS um, mentor, or not mentor, the champion for that. But what I'd say to people is find a mentor, seek a mentor. And there's people in this room here who are mentors to me as well, and you know who you are. So always I'm looking for mentoring and support for that, because it's so powerful, and I can't say any more than that in relation to that. Having a clear vision and developing a plan, and there's a model for you around that. You know, you plan, you do, review, refine, enhance. A constant cycle of planning is going to be part of that. And that comes from the Kaizen principle, which you may have heard of, the Japanese term continuous improvement. So you think of the Japanese, a technologically advanced nation, they're constantly striving for improvement all the time. That cycle of improvement is something that you're, you're working towards. Very importantly is creating the right culture. And that comes in, it develops in, in, in evolutionary within a group, but unless you have the right culture, you're not going to promote buy-in. So creating that right culture is going to be very important, particularly in high-performance teams. I'm very convinced the more and more as my career has gone on that standards and behaviours really make the difference. I think in every walk of life, I certainly see that in high-performance sport. Okay? It's the the behaviours, the standards that are set are the ones that are going to make a difference. But I think it applies to all walks of life. Um, Surrounding yourself with positive people. I gave the example of our jockey research group. Fantastic group of people. We're all connected. We have fun. But, you know, there's no dickheads there. So we work together in that collective group. Okay, so surround yourself with the positive people. Um, celebrate success. And I always say that to people. No matter how small the success is, celebrate it. Buy yourself a cup of coffee. Take yourself out for a meal or whatever it is. But celebrate success. It's so important. I think we don't do enough of that. And, but also learn from your, your, your disappointments, but fail fast. And I can give countless examples of athletes who have underperformed, they've gone away, they've reviewed, they've reflected, they've changed things, and they've come back better. So fail fast, learn from the disappointments is going to be very important as part of that. The final one I have there, and I've got two slides left and then we're finished, is excellence is a mindset and a journey. It's not a destination. So excellence is about what you do every day, your mindset, the success will take care of itself if you look after the excellence on a daily basis. So that would be important. So I'm going to finish the last word to a, a, a Limerick, Limerick man, Sam Lynch. Um, he studied in UL. Um, he has one of the unique accolades that he's a double world champion, single skull rowing, consecutive years. So he retained his title, in other words. And I remember sitting down to him after he won his second title. And I said, what is success to you? What do you attribute your success? And he said to me, it isn't easy, but it's simple. And I had to think about it. And I said to him, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, it isn't easy. You have to work hard. You have to sacrifice. You have to get up every day and do the training. If you put the plan in place, you surround yourself with the right people. It's really simple. It's a step process. You've got to do the work. But if you put the plan in place, it's simple. So it's really interesting from that point of view. So finally, I'd just like to uh, pay tribute to my father and dedicate this lecture to him. Sadly, he passed away in 2021. He has been a major influence on my life. Um, he's been a major support to me throughout my career when I changed from banking, which he was slightly disappointed about. But he, he did say to me when I got my PhD, it was the best thing I ever did. So that, that's a good thing. And I'll finish up with a, a lovely uh, quote there from Marcel Prost. Let us be grateful for the people who make us happy. They're the charming gardeners who make our souls blossom. So thank you very much.